Coming up on Techzilla, it's Bad Hair Monday. Tech questions are back. We're going to clean up your PC, clear up fun about traveling with digital media, and we've got more CS goodness like our festival of keyboards. So fill up a tub of hot water and soak, 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 because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by Squarespace, Busted Tees, and Netflix. Go to netflix.com slash techzilla for your free trial membership. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the best Hawaiian BBQ in Las Vegas, we've got an answer for you. It's not barbecue, it's sugar sauce. It's still pretty good though. You will have to take me to a Hawaiian barbecue place because the last one I went to was like, it was just bad. All right. It was a bad. All right, there's scene. some good places in San Francisco too. Oh, we can just so go to we'll Memphis Minis. Brisket. We could just do that. Mm, hey, and you know the rules. Hey, we're back. Uh, various crew members from Techzilla and the rest of the Revision 3 crew are still suffering the ill effects of a week in Las Vegas with I no moisture in the air. I have a cold. You have a cold. Lofthouse has a cold. Um, Several other people are, are in various stages of illness. We still haven't seen one of our interim. We know he got on the plane because he was hand delivered to the plane, but we think, we hope he will recover shortly. Yes, indeed. And we hope that you enjoyed our CES coverage. If you haven't seen all the shiny things that Robert, Patrick, and I found, check out revision3.com slash CES or youtube.com slash techhd for all the fabulous videos. So They're fabulous. It was kind of a crazy week last week. Oh, man, yeah. It was it was a little nutso, but we got some good stuff. Between us and Callie Lewis and the Hack 5 mm -hmm. crew, uh, there's something like 75 videos got posted. Yeah. You and I and Robert did almost 40 of those. It so, felt that way. It felt that way. That's how it felt, <laughs> yes. Hey, it was my, fun. I, this one just kind of wigged me out, right? Google Goggles 1.3 came mm -hmm. out today. Google says Goggles 1.3 for Android can scan barcodes almost instantly. That's not very disturbing. Identify print ads and search for the product or brand. Much big expansion over what they started in November. Also not disturbing. And oh yeah, apparently it kicks ass at Sudoku. Huh. Seriously, the Google blog says if you ever get stuck, take a clear picture of the entire puzzle with goggles and we'll tell you the correct solution. That's good because I cannot do that stuff. Sudoku? Oh, I cannot do that at all. Nope. Apparently, it's the big hobby of the programmers at, uh, at Google. All I'm yeah. saying is AI, cars that drive themselves. I don't care if Marissa Meyer denied it when I interviewed her, but Google is totally going to be the contractor that builds Skynet. I believe that. If, yeah. they, invent, if they start investing in like crazy stainless steel, high tensile, you know, freaking titanium companies. The goggles are cool, and I'm glad that I can now use an Android phone to cheat at Sudoku. <laughs> Been thinking about an iPhone? Well, Apple dropped their price on the 8 gigabyte iPhone 3GS to $49 with a two-year contract, just like AT&T, uh, which should be just in time for Verizon to announce their iPhone 4 this week. I know so many people who are furious about this $49 iPhone right now. How many? Because well, they bought the... Yeah, because they bought it full price, you like know, last like week? a year ago or whatever, and now they're like, Ah, but you know, that's, you can only expect to have an Apple product for a year before it's obsolete. Maybe even less, eight months, six yeah, months. Yeah, I, I bought two iPads, you know, last year, and now I'm going to be finding out a new one probably in three weeks by watching <laughs> Apple's website like everybody else. I don't know. I actually got to say, I would might be thinking about an Android phone over the 3GS. There was no shortage of ones announced at CES this year. I don't even want to talk about it. There were like <laughs> 32,000 Android phones. Hopefully, we're going to get Sasha Sagan from PCMag.com on at some point to talk about all the phone announcements. Um, great coverage up at PC Mag. Mm -hmm. This was kind of fun. No less an August news source from the BBC says Microsoft is reporting phantom data use by Windows Phone 7 to the tune of 30 to 50 megabytes of data every day, like uploads, downloads. It doesn't sound like much, but in 20 days, you'll burn through a gigabyte, which is half of AT&T's two gigabyte monthly data cap. What are they on the doing? Windows 7 phones. They're, they're, we're like, I don't know. We got to figure that out. They have to figure that out. They have to Good. figure that out. Get on that. <laughs> As of NVIDIA's CES announcements about their new high performance line of ARM processors and the Tegra 2 CPU weren't enough, this morning they announced a $1.5 billion six year technology licensing deal with Intel. Yeah. Uh, it's an extension of an existing patent deal between the two companies, uh, but both companies dropped 
all their existing lawsuits. Yeah. It's so they're friends like, now, yay! Yeah, like they've had an existing patent thing, and then they were getting into lawsuits, and they're like, screw it, and tell us, we'll, we'll cut you a bunch of checks over it's, the next six years. It's much more profitable to be friends sometimes than enemies. <laughs> True, and from the announcements we didn't really expect at CES Department, Ford said there will be an electric version, a completely electric version of the Ford Focus available late 2011 in the United States, 2012 in Europe. Basically the same exact car as the gas version, including the, the steering should feel the same, although it is electric steering, they promise it'll feel the same. Uh, electric traction motor, it drops 181 foot-pounds of torque, lithium-ion batteries, water-cooled, 100-mile range, not my favorite, but it'll cover my commute. It promises to recharge in three or four hours if you've got a 240-volt line in your garage if you buy the optional $1,500 box, which I guess is going to be distributed at Best Buy. So it won't be the road trip champ in your family. Again, Ford's tweeted that the range will be up to 100 miles. I think if you like drive to work uphill at 85 or 80, I guess 84 miles an hour is the top speed. Uh, I suspect the range will be shorter. The Chevy Volt, of course, can run on gasoline when the batteries drop out. So, and I'll say it now, in case you missed Techzilla last month, Ford has been a sponsor of Techzilla. Please don't tell me we're shills. I just want an electric car for my commute so I can thumb my nose at the millions of Prius owners in the Bay Area, or Prius, and I'd like something my whole family can fit to, into, which isn't going to happen in a used Sparrow. I don't know if you've ever seen the Sparrow. It looks like a giant sort of Italian disco shoe with an yeah. electric motorcycle inside. Very interesting. Yes. All right, well, <laughs> let's get to our first tech question in a week. A week. After all these video reviews we've been doing, we got this email from Jake who wrote in, I am looking at ways to clean off some of the clutter on my PC. Is there any software like AppZapper but for PC? People have told me to use a registry cleaner. Could you shed some light on what it does exactly? and if it would truly help Jake in Rumson, New Jersey. Well, you can use the program uninstaller in Windows to remove apps that you don't want. Um, OS X doesn't really offer anything similar, which is why third-party tools like AppZapper and its free alternative, App Cleaner, are so popular. And of course, there are, you know, a lot of times programs come with uninstallers. You can either mm -hmm. use the one built in utilities in Windows or just use the one that came with the app. Doesn't um, mean they actually uninstall everything, not, but it's a good start. Maybe not completely, but <laughs> you know how it works. Um, if you can't seem to get rid of a specific program, Program because it has no uninstall entry or the uninstaller fails, try the free version of Revo Uninstaller. We've recommended this on the show a bunch of times. As to your other question, the registry is the database Windows uses to keep track of system configuration, settings, and options. Um, as time goes on, the registry can become bloated with orphaned or outdated registry settings. Cleaning can help improve performance by removing unneeded entries, which is kind of what happens with, uh, with programs like right. AppZapper. It just takes that whole package from OS. 10 and deletes it right. all. Windows has things all over the place, so it's a little more complicated sometimes. Yeah. Um, a great tool that we like is CCleaner from Piriform. It's also freeware, which is nice. I will say there's sort of a super geek kind of thing to do, which is manually editing your registry and manually deleting things. If you aren't comfortable, if you don't know what you're looking at when you look at the registry, I highly recommend not manually deleting things, unless yeah. you're following very explicit destruction, destructions. Destructions. That is appropriate. Yes, <laughs> very explicit instructions from, from somebody you trust on the internets or, or your neighborhood. Just be careful when you start playing with the mm -hmm. registry. Coming up next, oh, we got more toys coming from, where's that? CES. But first, we got some more viewer questions. And before that, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Squarespace.com. Web hosting, website building, all in one simple place. And you know what? It's all about making an amazing website without having to be, well, code friendly. Actually, Squarespace itself is super code friendly. If you are a super geek, you can get in and adjust the code, but if you are a noob, if you are unfamiliar with the code, if you hate the code, Squarespace is going to give you some nice WYSIWYG tools that allow you to make a high-end complex website that is uniquely your own without dropping a lot of cash to somebody who's mean and cruel in their emails about developing your website. Doesn't matter, by the way, if you have a question at four in the morning, because Squarespace offers everybody who signs up free 24-7 support. Now, for social networking fans, Squarespace just pushed a brand new social widget for geolocation services. What does that mean? You can display your most recent check-ins from Foursquare, Gowalla, and Facebook places on a live Google map on your web page. Squarespace is the only web publishing platform that has a native built-in solution for displaying all that check-in data so people can stalk you no matter where you go. Widget is totally customizable and fully integrated with the Squarespace style editor 
And if you're too busy to be tied down to computer screens, check out Squarespace's iPhone app. Let you blog on the go, let you moderate comments, you can get push notifications to approve new comments. Kind of dangerous if you get sort of a gigantic set of responses to a new post, but it's there for you. And you can mark existing comments as spam, reply to comments, and all more, all from your iPhone, which should be with you everywhere you go. Many of the internet's highest traffic web pages, powered by Squarespace, not to mention many of the personal pages of Revision 3's hosts and personalities like me. Do yourself a favor, go to squarespace.com, you get a two-week free trial, and then if you decide to sign up, do me a favor, enter in the code TECHZILLA when you check out, you'll score 10% off the lifetime of your order, and you'll be supporting TechZilla when you do. That's TechZilla when you check out at squarespace.com. Daniel wrote us this question asking, I've heard about the hardware support for video transcoding in Sandy Bridge, but failed to find more detail about it. Does this capability require special software in order to function? If yes, do you know any software that is claimed to support it? I always need to encode the HD MOV file shop on my Canon DSLR, and this has been a very slow process on my Core 2 Duo notebook. Cheers, Daniel in Shanghai. We need to go on a food tour with Daniel in Shanghai. Ooh. I bet the food in Shanghai is I've epic. seen enough No Reservations to know, <laughs> to know better than I'm Let's go on a food tour with Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, that would be good. He's a little more brave than I am when it comes to food. but It's all about the ones. giant, yeah, let's not even talk about weird snake beverages. Um, okay, hardware accelerated transcoding, Sandy Bridge, Intel calls it quick sync because apparently that's more marketing friendly, can be, according to Nantech and other websites, a hefty, a huge, a healthy leaf in uh, encoding and transcoding performance. We say can because, as Nantech's reviews posted on uh, January 3rd pointed out, quick sync transcode, which sounds a lot like Fox and Socks if you have a small child, is only supported by two applications, Cyberlink's Media Espresso 6 and ArcSoft's Media Converter 7. That is a very short list. And then on January 7th, Yes, Intel announced a prototype QuickSync plugin for Adobe Pro and various consumer products. Uh, whether Handbrake will be one of them remains to be seen, of course. What this means for you, my friend David in Shanghai, is any and all potential updates to all encoding software could be a few months away to take advantage of the QuickSync technology. So don't count on using it to help speed up your Handbrake and codes just yet. And then we have another question from Michael in Glasgow. He, not Glasgow, Scotland. Glasgow, Kentucky. Kentucky. He gave us a serious pair of email questions. He writes, I am traveling overseas to visit David in Shanghai perhaps soon and would like to know, do the airport machines harm digital media cards or erase hard drives and camcorders? This is a major concern as I do not want to lose any photos or videos of this trip. Also, what about laptop computers? Uh, you, you pretty much have no worry about sliding a digital camera, your memory cards, your hard drives, your computers through the security machines at the airport. A bigger concern is actually doing something to tick off customs or putting your computer stuff in your bag. Um, if you refuse to give uh, customs the password, your encrypted files, and your hard drive, they can take your hard drive to inspect it. Uh, for how long, I haven't entirely figured out. My seriously paranoid friends talk about storing stuff on the internet rather than bringing it through customs or traveling with it on airlines. Uh, that's a very short list of friends, and they are very paranoid. Well, you know, it, it might just be easier to do it that way. I would, yeah. I'm not paranoid, but I would think of doing that as well. If you have the, you know, the capability of accessing like a big, some cloud storage, mm -hmm. if you can even find a place overseas like that has good, you right. know, upload times. It's and only going like, to take 12 there hours. <laughs> 40 hours where right. you could much better be out enjoying your actual vacation. Um, it is a good method mm -hmm. to, to prevent that from happening or to prevent, you know, if, you're, if all your memory cards fill up. And right. you want to be able to take more pictures and you don't have any way to offload them. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't have a laptop with you, but just in case that happened for some reason, having cloud storage backup is a, is a good instance. Like having a Dropbox folder right. would be good for that. Which brings us to his second question. I, I will say, I'm actually more worried about my notebook being stolen when I travel. Well, there's that too. Than, than the, you know, the, the airport security machines, you know, mm -hmm. they're not going to harm your hard drives, but... Or, or your data cards. Yeah, but it's kind of hard to, to think about that kind of stuff when you're traveling to remember to make backups or to remember to right. upload it to the cloud. But <laughs> if you do have gigs and gigs worth of photos that are very precious to you that you want to make sure are safe, that's a good way to make sure that they're in a good spot that won't get stolen or destroyed. Or copy them to a portable hard drive and put that in your scariest looking pair of underwear there at the you bottom go. of your bag. Perfect. <laughs> His second question is about WPA2 security. My desktop uses hardwired ethernet, but my laptop is wireless using WPA2 security. I am concerned about logging into my banking account and paying bills and such on my laptop on the wireless connection. Should I be worried or am I just paranoid? Should I be running some kind of software that will guarantee encryption? By the way, I'm running Windows 7 Home Premium with Trend Micro 
antivirus and built-in firewall with a Vizio router with a built-in firewall. <laughs> Thanks. Keep up the great work and great show. Michael in Kentucky. Well, here's the thing, right? WPA2 is pretty secure. You have a choice of encryption technologies. I haven't heard that anyone is, is more secure than any other. The thing is, like, to crack WPA2, somebody's going to have to know your network, basically set up a computer, and capture all of the traffic coming from your router or between your router and your other clients in your home until it either captures a handshake transaction when you log in. And then once they have all the information they need, they're going to start running a database of, of, of uh, basically a giant table of potential passwords against it until they find one that works. I'm assuming you haven't ticked off the NSA, in which case it'd say your network's probably already cracked. Yeah, it, would have to, it would have to be like a targeted attack. Somebody would, yeah, right? as, yeah. If you have like, if if you know, as long, okay. Here's here's the biggest danger, mm -hmm. like changing your your login to your, not changing your login from like admin to admin when you buy your router. Yes, that's something that we still run into, even in San Francisco, right? You know, a lot of hip technical people here, and it'll be like Bob's router, and and well, so we've also even talked in the past about a website that shows all the default passwords right. for. For, for routers, I can't remember the name of it. Serafina will plug it into the show later. <laughs> but yeah, it's. I mean, that information is easily out there. So if you haven't changed it to something more secure, right. it would be a good idea to do that. But if you've changed your passwords and you're using WPA2 security, I mean, I use it at home. I use it with my banking. I use it with all of the scary stuff that I never ever want anybody to find me looking at on the internet. So you should be just fine. Yeah, we don't even have wired connections in our house between yeah. you know after the router. It's all, everything's wireless, all our computers. All of it. So if you can figure out where yes. Veronica Belmont lives. Hey, don't do that. Plant a computer somewhere okay. near her home. <laughs> so Luke in Australia writes in asking us, I was just wondering, do you know of a peripheral hub which will plug into eSATA and allow multiple USB connections into that? The reason I'm interested is because there is a lot more bandwidth available over eSATA, so I would be able to run multiple USB 2.0 devices at their full speed. At least this is what I'm assuming. Are you able to help out at all? Think of a normal USB hub, although instead of plugging into the computer via USB, I will plug it into the eSATA port. Luke in Australia. So yeah, unfortunately, eSATA and USB are incompatible bus architectures, correct? Mm, as far as I know, like you might find a PCI Express USB adapter that will add additional ports. You can spread out the USB 2.0 load instead of all of having on happening on sort of the USB bus on your motherboard. Right, you can go from, from eSATA used via USB, but not right. the other way Yeah, it's around. kind of, yeah, yeah, eSATA to USB, yes. USB hub to eSATA, not so much. Right, so USB 3 is hyped to be faster than the current eSATA spec, um, but of course you'll need a USB 3 drive interface to attain that faster speed that USB 3 can offer. And, and USB 3.0 components and right. stuff. Although I wonder, gosh, that would be an interesting thought. I'm going to play around with my USB 3 adapter to mm -hmm. see if I can get... Okay, I, I would have to play around with my USB. What are you doing across multiple USB devices that's saturating the bus, actually? That's what I want to know, young man. Because how would you do it? Because keyboards don't use any bandwidth, and a netcam barely uses any bandwidth. I mean, okay. I want to know. We want more info. We want more info. I want to know <laughs> what you're doing. I, I mean, are you copying things to multiple drives simultaneously, which is not actually doable in the Windows architecture? Hmm. Hmm. I want to know. Yeah, tell us. Fill us in. <laughs> we can help better with more information. Also, we're just really curious. Yeah. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing over there anyway in Australia? What do they maybe, do maybe down there? Maybe like copying to OneDrive and wants to be able to move stuff from somewhere I'm else. I'm sure we're going to get a million responses over email. People who will obviously well, he's doing blah, 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 really blah, 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 blah. You don't actually sound like that, guys. It's just <laughs> sometimes when you're correcting us, that's how I hear it in my brain. Well, <laughs> it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Busted Tees. The dudes over at College Humor set up this site as a depot for funny shirts back in 2004, and they've been putting out the most awesome designs you're going to find on the internet ever since. It doesn't matter if you're into video games, movies, geography, politics, science fiction, or just wrapping your torso with something weird. Busted Tees literally has you covered. Literally, the proper use of literally. They're the coolest items of clothing since windbreakers were invented. Um, wait, windbreakers are cool, right? Yeah. They're still cool. The 80s are back, so windbreakers must be All back. All right. You might have seen a busted tier two pop up in movies like Knocked Up and shows like Scrubs. Now you can grab one to have for your very own forever and ever and ever. And they're printed right in the good old USA on high quality, super soft materials in a sweatshop free environment. So you won't be plagued with guilt when you order them, which is, you know, always a plus. Head on over to BustedTees.com right now. Actually, we'll finish watching this video first, then head over to Busted Tees, start scrolling, and get ready to find the shirt of your dreams. Your bizarre, bizarre, wonderful dreams. It's where your haters gonna hate t-shirt came from. Haters gonna hate. <laughs> Enter the promo code Texilla and receive 10% off your order. 
Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Long Reads. If you're looking for content that fits your schedule, whether it's your train ride to work, your 30 minutes on the elliptical machine, or just reading for a while before bed, look no further than longreads.com. These are full articles tagged by fellow readers or the editor that fit a certain time frame to finish reading. They can be magazine articles, editorials, short stories, historical documents, etc., and they're curated and organized by topics for easy searching. When you need something to read, head over to the site and enter in a search word. Then select approximately for how long you'd like to be reading for. The results will pop up below, and you can get some info on how long it should take you to read this article, who it's by, what publication, and when it was first published. The site is nice and clean and lends itself very well to mobile browsing. I can see this working great with something like Instapaper, for example, though you could always just use it to find great articles to read while sitting at your desk on your lunch break. If you want to submit an article to the database, just add the Long Reads hashtag to the end of a tweet with the link attached, and that will add it to the raw feed. Check it all out at longreads.com. Due to what I'll call in seriously technical terms a major audio fail involving a shooting with a DSLR that does 1080p video experiment, we weren't able to deliver segments from CES about the GoPro's 3D Hero and Contour's GPS HD. New gear from two of the more popular strap it to your head or your rifle or whatever camera companies. GoPro's 3D Hero is a $99 case with a sync cable. You throw in a free download from GoPro and you've got a relatively low dollar way to turn a pair of GoPro HD Hero cameras into a stereo shooting rig to generate 3D video. If you already have a GoPro HD, that'll be about 358 because you'll need a second camera and the nifty little case and cable. Uh, a little over 600 bucks if you're starting from scratch, you need two of the tiny GoPro HD cameras. Contour GPS HD has been buzzed about and commented on for quite some time, but it is finally out for sale. It's also a 1080p camera. Think eight hours of 1080p, 30 frames per second video on a single 32 gigabyte micro SD card packed with GPS into a 5.2 ounce rather tiny device that straps to your head with one big sliding button to get your video on. Sells for about $349 if you find it online. Now let Veronica and I battle over keyboards. Yes. <laughs> First up, the Smartfish Engage keyboard, which promises to keep your wrist from falling apart 2,400 characters at a time. Patrick had a chance to talk to the inventor who's seriously happy to be at CES. I type. I type a lot. I type several bazillion. Well, basically, I'm spending 60 hours a week on a keyboard. What's that mean? Eventually, even these big giant wrists are going to collapse. Enter Jack Atzmon. You are a chiropractor. How do you end up as a chiropractor with a peripherals company? Um, I came from a long line of inventors. My dad was a pretty big inventor, and I have cousins. A lot of them are inventors. So I did it since I was a child. This is a pretty simple product. We're talking about the Smartfish, the Engage. It's a keyboard that moves. It doesn't move a lot. Right, you know, when I first got into this whole concept, I was actually at a Best Buy in Manhattan, and I was looking at the Microsoft Natural. A keyboard is supposed to treat repetitive stress injury, but what I noticed was it didn't move. So it didn't do anything about the repetition. So it's really odd to have something that treats repetition but doesn't affect the repetition. Because Microsoft's like, it's a 15 degree angle, the natural end of the brain, and then it leaves the wrist in the 15 degree angle forever. forever. What's going on with the motion here? This one learns. It learns when you've been in the same position for too long, and on its own, like a robot, it changes position. It changes the height and it, cha and it spreads apart. We, we average about an hour, about 10 to 15 emails, average emails, it makes a subtle change in your position. And the, that's all you need, just that little bit of motion. Just a little bit of motion. It was developed with the hospital special surgery and P9 design all in the New York City area and really thoroughly went through it. It was really nothing in this space at all. No company had ever tried to make a, a device, a peripheral, actually do something for us. Not since the Jetsons that we had something this cool and this reactive that really helps us, you know, and it's, it's absolutely amazing. It really represents the death of the lazy, ill-conceived peripherals. The mouse is the smart fish world. Does it also have the motorized movement? Yes, this mini world has a passive pivot. And what it does is with a rigid mouse, as you move it around, you, you know, you have to change your hands in infinite amounts of subtle positions, and it tires the wrists and the elbow and the shoulder. With a pivoting mouse, what it does is it makes the changes for you, it works for you, so your hand doesn't get tired, it doesn't have to accommodate the mouse, the mouse accommodates you. Keyboard's 150 bucks, before you start whining, think about the cost of surgery and not being able to type for a few weeks, what's the cost on the mice? The mice are $49.99 for the mini and the desktop world, and Apple asked us to make a Bluetooth version, and those will be $59.99 for those. Apple asked you? They did. Next, the terribly tempting IO Gear Multi-Link Bluetooth Keyboard. 
and I'm here at IO Gear taking a look at the multi-link Bluetooth keyboard with touchpad. Now this keyboard is of course a wireless keyboard that connects to up to six devices over Bluetooth. And by changing going function one, function two, or function three, depending on how you have it assigned, you can use this keyboard with any one of these devices. Um, it's going to retail for $79 out next month, but this is just a really great way to have one keyboard that connects to everything so you don't have to be jumping around from your iPad to your netbook, to back to your big laptop, any device, even a smartphone that you can connect a keyboard with over Bluetooth, you can use with this keyboard. I suspect there might be a couple more products from CES coming in the next few weeks, but I promise none of them will be keyboards. Our keyboard is done. Tapped out. <laughs> we've got our keyboard on. Yes, but still to come, we've got more of your viewer questions. But first, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. Netflix delivers movies directly to your home, saving you time, money, and hassle. As a Netflix member, you can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streaming directly to your PC, Mac, or right to your TV via Netflix ready device like the Xbox 360, PS3, and the Nintendo Wii console. Plus, you get DVDs by mail in about one business day if you want to roll old school style. Watch as many videos as you want. Shipping is free, and there are never any late fees or due dates. Keep the movies as long as you like. DVDs by mail, plus instantly to your TV. Get unlimited movies two ways for one low monthly price. As a new member and a Texilla viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to www.netflix.com slash Texilla and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so they know we sent you over there. Normally, we think of Blue Hand as being a Bluetooth headset company. This year at CES, Ms. Belmont found they were focusing less about replacing your existing Bluetooth headset and more about making the whole hands-free calling experience that much better. Blue Ant is one of Patrick's favorite products, so we're taking a look at some of the hands-free devices that they just announced here at CES. Right here, we've got the S3. It's a updated version of the S4. It's a little bit less expensive, and it also loses a few of the features, but it is going to give you a $20 price point difference. And they also announced a partnership with the application makers of Lingo, and they're integrating that into all their hardware products as well. What that does is it lets you make hands-free calling, hands-free text messaging dictation, and also turn-by-turn -turn navigation right from the device of your choice. When you buy one of these hardware pieces, you'll get a certificate saying that you can download the application for free, and that'll work on Nokia, Blackberry, Android, iOS, iOS, etc. The hardware will be available Q1 of this year as well as the Vlingo applications and uh, this is going to run you $79. Kevin's got a project idea. Dun, dun, dun. I have a great idea for an episode. How to host a website from home with Linux. I am a complete Linux noob and know nothing about Windows XP, Windows 7, or Small Business Server 2003, whatever. A complete step-by-step -step would be great on how to get the software, programs, and security installed and configured. What needs to be done at DynDNS.org and pointing a domain name from GoDaddy or from whoever to get it all running. It would be a great system segment. I hope you find folks would do this. Thanks, Kevin. I would actually love to do a segment because I've been playing around with it at home on how to use DynDNS and your router or a box you build to access, basically to create your own private VPN, give you secure access if you're in like some crazy hotel in the middle of nowhere or, or more likely some crazy hotel full of scary business people because mm -hmm. um, you know they're looking at your files. Oh yeah. You know anybody in a suit is looking at your files. Um, and most of that would apply to your DIY web hosting. Hosting a website, though, a web server inside of your home invites hacking and hackers. You really need to be on top of security because sometimes, you know, fairly big, you know, companies that provide uh, uh, web hosting don't keep on top of your security. And I think don't take us personally, even less likely to working out of your home. I, I just don't recommend hosting a website that's going to be available publicly on the internet at home. We'll talk more about this next week, though. I mean, it's a great thing to play around with, but I just don't recommend hosting personal hosting a website out of your house. Gotcha. Just saying. All right. Finally, Don in Portland writes in, do you know of a Dropbox replacement that can run on our own machines and so never store our data on third-party servers, but still provide functions like automatic sync, sync across the internet and on the local network, provide the type of sync that only syncs the changed part of the file, shared folders with friends or coworkers. Any help you can provide would be much appreciated. Many thanks, Don in Portland. I'll ask you, you know, as far as you know, Dropbox is not doing a private label version of the system. Uh, I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no, but I'll double check. Um, Dropbox, though, is pretty secure. I've talked with Dropbox in the past. They said, quote, we use SSL for all file data and metadata communications with our servers. All data is stored encrypted with AES-256. Yeah, that's good. You know, they then also pointed out that all of the files that are stored on Dropbox are in the clear or unencrypted on your desktop, just a file on your desktop. Um, that topic, uh, my contact said, is a bit of 
contention inside of Dropbox because many feel that the password used to access is kind of false security because your files are still exposed. He said you're better off using CryptoFS, BitLocker, or FileVault if you really want security of your data. Oh yeah, and password protect your user account. So one thing you might think of is you know if you encrypt the the behoozits out of your files before you stop them on stop them store them on Dropbox, mm -hmm. that would make them relatively impossible to crack or or find even if somebody for some reason manages to cap at Dropbox. One of the advantages is Dropbox, they don't cap or throttle at their end of things. That makes for some period, pretty serious sync speed if you have decent upload speed at your network. Uh, I'm curious though, if anybody out there in the TZ crew has a way to replicate the glory that is Dropbox or Sugar Sync for a corporation, email us on how you do it and we'll share it with Don and the rest of the world. Because you could, you know, it might be nice if you used encryption software on your low, I don't know, that, that you would have to want to encrypt yeah, all the information used by all your end users. That's what I'm trying to figure out if, if encrypting the folder would do any kind of extra security, I don't think that would really help. Well, if you encrypt... Not once it went up to the cloud anyway. Sure, because it would be like encryption inside of encryption. Because somebody would have to get through Dropbox's 256-bit AES, then they'd get to your encrypted file inside of that. It would be like a double cookie from hell. Why, why yeah, okay. I was thinking more if your local Dropbox folder was encrypted, that wouldn't prevent anyone from coming from outside of accessing your files in the cloud. That wouldn't add any extra protection, well, would it? Well, because the Dropbox would sync whatever was in the Dropbox folder, but it should sync an encrypted file. This is a whole separate segment <laughs> that we should really be holding this for, so. For everybody watching, <laughs> we must go. But we live in your questions, so email us, techzillatrevision3.com. Check out product reviews, how to's. You ask us, we'll do it, but we need your email, so please, don't be shy. Send them into techzillatrevision3.com or at techzilla on the Twitters. Yes, even better. Send us in a video question. Please. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Because it's really not fair. I mean, they see our mugs every week and we ever hardly ever get to see their mugs. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with a video question in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash techzilla. Now they're all going to send us pictures of their coffee mugs. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Techzilla.